Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. Tuesdays with Mori. An Old Man, A Young Man, and Life's Greatest Lesson. By Mitch Album. The Curriculum. The last class of my old professor's life took place once a week in his house, by a window in the study where he could watch a small hibiscus plant shed its pink leaves. The class met on Tuesdays. It began after breakfast. The subject was the meaning of life. It was taught from experience. No grades were given, but there were oral exams each week. You were expected to respond to questions, and you were expected to pose questions of your own. You were also required to perform physical tasks now and then, such as lifting the professor's head to a comfortable spot on the pillow or placing his glasses on the bridge of his nose. Kissing him goodbye earned you extra credit. No books were required, yet many topics were covered, including love, work, community, family, aging, forgiveness, and, finally, death. The last lecture was brief, only a few words. A funeral was held in lieu of graduation. Although no final exam was given, you were expected to produce one long paper on what was learned. That paper is presented here. The last class of my old professor's life had only one student. I was the student. It is the late spring of 1979, a hot, sticky Saturday afternoon. Hundreds of us sit together, side by side, in rows of wooden folding chairs on the main campus lawn. We wear blue nylon robes. We listen impatiently to long speeches. When the ceremony is over, we throw our caps in the air and we are officially graduated from college, the senior class of Brandeis University in the city of Waltham, Massachusetts. For many of us, the curtain has just come down on childhood. Afterward, I find Maury Schwartz, my favorite professor, and introduce him to my parents. He is a small man who takes small steps, as if a strong wind could, at any time, whisk him up into the clouds. In his graduation day robe, he looks like a cross between a biblical prophet and a Christmas elf he has sparkling blue-green eyes, thinning silver hair that spills onto his forehead, big ears, a triangular nose, and tufts of graying eyebrows. Although his teeth are crooked and his lower ones are slanted back as if someone had once punched them in when he smiles it's as if you'd just told him the first joke on earth. He tells my parents how I took every class he taught. He tells them, you have a special boy here. Embarrassed, I look at my feet. Before we leave, I hand my professor a present, a tan briefcase with his initials on the front. I bought this the day before at a shopping mall. I didn't want to forget him. Maybe I didn't want him to forget me. Mitch, you are one of the good ones, he says, admiring the briefcase. Then he hugs me. I feel his thin arms around my back. I am taller than he is, and when he holds me, I feel awkward, older, as if I were the parent and he were the child. He asks if I will stay in touch, and without hesitation I say, of course. When he steps back, I see that he is crying. The Syllabus His death sentence came in the summer of 1994. Looking back, Maury knew something bad was coming long before that. He knew it the day he gave up dancing. He had always been a dancer, my old professor. The music didn't matter. Rock and roll, big band, the blues. He loved them all. He would close his eyes and with a blissful smile begin to move to his own sense of rhythm. It wasn't always pretty. But then, he didn't worry about a partner. Maury danced by himself. He used to go to this church in Harvard Square every Wednesday night for something called Dance Free. They had flashing lights and booming speakers and Maury would wander in among the mostly student crowd, wearing a white t-shirt and black sweatpants and a towel around his neck, and whatever music was playing, that's the music to which he danced. He'd do the Lindy to Jimi Hendrix. He twisted and twirled, 
he waved his arms like a conductor on amphetamines, until sweat was dripping down the middle of his back. No one there knew he was a prominent doctor of sociology, with years of experience as a college professor and several well-respected books. They just thought he was some old nut. Once, he brought a tango tape and got them to play it over the speakers. Then he commandeered the floor, shooting back and forth like some hot Latin lover. When he finished, everyone applauded. He could have stayed in that moment forever. But then the dancing stopped. He developed asthma in his sixties. His breathing became labored. One day he was walking along the Charles River, and a cold burst of wind left him choking for air. He was rushed to the hospital and injected with adrenaline. A few years later, he began to have trouble walking. At a birthday party for a friend, he stumbled inexplicably. Another night, he fell down the steps of a theater, startling a small crowd of people. Give him air, someone yelled. He was in his seventies by this point, so they whispered old age and helped him to his feet. But Maury, who was always more in touch with his insides than the rest of us, knew something else was wrong. This was more than old age. He was weary all the time. He had trouble sleeping. He dreamt he was dying. He began to see doctors. Lots of them. They tested his blood. They tested his urine. They put a scope up his rear end and looked inside his intestines. Finally, when nothing could be found, one doctor ordered a muscle biopsy, taking a small piece out of Maury's calf. The lab report came back suggesting a neurological problem, and Maury was brought in for yet another series of tests. In one of those tests, he sat in a special seat as they zapped him with electrical current and electric chair, of sorts and studied his neurological responses. We need to check this further, the doctor said, looking over his results. Why? Maury asked. What is it? We're not sure. Your times are slow. His times were slow? What did that mean? Finally, on a hot, humid day in August 1994, Maury and his wife, Charlotte, went to the neurologist's office, and he asked them to sit before he broke the news, Maury had a myotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a brutal, unforgiving illness of the neurological system. There was no known cure. How did I get it? Maury asked. Nobody knew. Is it terminal? Yes. So I'm going to die. Yes, you are, the doctor said. I'm very sorry. He sat with Maury and Charlotte for nearly two hours, patiently answering their questions. When they left, the doctor gave them some information on ALS, little pamphlets, as if they were opening a bank account. Outside, the sun was shining and people were going about their business. A woman ran to put money in the parking meter. Another carried groceries. Charlotte had a million thoughts running through her mind, how much time do we have left? How will we manage? How will we pay the bills? My old professor, meanwhile, was stunned by the normalcy of the day around him. Shouldn't the world stop? Don't they know what has happened to me? But the world did not stop, it took no notice at all, and as Maury pulled weakly on the car door, he felt as if he were dropping into a hole. Now what? He thought. As my old professor searched for answers, the disease took him over, day by day, week by week. He backed the car out of the garage one morning and could barely push the brakes. That was the end of his driving. He kept tripping, so he purchased a cane. That was the end of his walking free. He went for his regular swim at the YMCA, but found he could no longer undress himself. So he hired his first home care worker a theology student named Tony who helped him in and out of the pool, and in and out of his bathing suit. In the locker room, the other swimmers pretended not to stare. They stared anyhow. That was the end of his privacy. In the fall of 1994, Maury came to the Hilly Brandeis campus to teach his final college course. 
he could have skipped this, of course. The university would have understood. Why suffer in front of so many people? Stay at home. Get your affairs in order. But the idea of quitting did not occur to Mori. Instead, he hobbled into the classroom, his home for more than thirty years. Because of the cane, he took a while to reach the chair. Finally, he sat down, dropped his glasses off his nose, and looked out at the young faces who stared back in silence. My friends, I assume you are all here for the social psychology class. I have been teaching this course for twenty years, and this is the first time I can say there is a risk in taking it, because I have a fatal illness. I may not live to finish the semester. If you feel this is a problem, I understand if you wish to drop the course. He smiled. And that was the end of his secret. ALS is like a lit candle, it melts your nerves and leaves your body a pile of wax. Often, it begins with the legs and works its way up. You lose control of your thigh muscles, so that you cannot support yourself standing. You lose control of your trunk muscles, so that you cannot sit up straight. By the end, if you are still alive, you are breathing through a tube in a hole in your throat, while your soul, perfectly awake, is imprisoned inside a limp husk, perhaps able to blink or cluck a tongue, like something from a science fiction movie, the man frozen inside his own flesh. This takes no more than five years from the day you contract the disease. Maury's doctors guessed he had two years left. Maury knew it was less. But my old professor had made a profound decision, one he began to construct the day he came out of the doctor's office with a sword hanging over his head. Do I wither up and disappear, or do I make the best of my time left? He had asked himself. He would not wither. He would not be ashamed of dying. Instead, he would make death his final project, the center point of his days. Since everyone was going to die, he could be of great value, right? He could be research. A human textbook. Study me in my slow and patient demise. Watch what happens to me. Learn with me. Mori would walk that final bridge between life and death, and narrate the trip. The fall semester passed quickly. The pills increased. Therapy became a regular routine. Nurses came to his house to work with Mori's withering legs, to keep the muscles active, bending them back and forth as if pumping water from a well. Massage specialists came by once a week to try to soothe the constant, heavy stiffness he felt. He met with meditation teachers, and closed his eyes and narrowed his thoughts until his world shrunk down to a single breath, in and out, in and out. One day, using his cane, he stepped onto the curb and fell over into the street. The cane was exchanged for a walker. As his body weakened, the back and forth to the bathroom became too exhausting, so Mori began to urinate into a large beaker. He had to support himself as he did this, meaning someone had to hold the beaker while Mori filled it. Most of us would be embarrassed by all this, especially at Mori's age. But Mori was not like most of us. When some of his close colleagues would visit, he would say to them, Listen, I have to pee. Would you mind helping? Are you okay with that? Often, to their own surprise, they were. In fact, he entertained a growing stream of visitors. He had discussion groups about dying, what it really meant, how societies had always been afraid of it without necessarily understanding it. He told his friends that if they really wanted to help him, they would treat him not with sympathy but with visits, phone calls, a sharing of their problems the way they had always shared their problems, because Mori had always been a wonderful listener. For all that was happening to him, his voice was strong and inviting, and his mind was vibrating with a million thoughts. He was intent on proving that the word dying was not synonymous with useless. The new year came and went. Although he never said it to anyone, Mori knew this would be the last year of his life. He was using a wheelchair now, and he was fighting time to say all the things he wanted to say to all the people he loved. 
When a colleague at Brandeis died suddenly of a heart attack, Maury went to his funeral. He came home depressed. What a waste, he said. All those people saying all those wonderful things, and have never got to hear any of it. Maury had a better idea. He made some calls. He chose a date. And on a cold Sunday afternoon, he was joined in his home by a small group of friends and family for a living funeral. Each of them spoke and paid tribute to my old professor. Some cried. Some laughed. One woman read a poem, My dear and loving cousin. Your ageless heart as you move through time, layer on layer, tender sequoia. Maury cried and laughed with them. And all the heartfelt things we never get to say to those we love, Maury said that day. His living funeral was a rousing success. Only Maury wasn't dead yet. In fact, the most unusual part of his life was about to unfold. The student. At this point, I should explain what had happened to me since that summer day when I last hugged my dear and wise professor, and promised to keep in touch. I did not keep in touch. In fact, I lost contact with most of the people I knew in college, including my beer-drinking friends and the first woman I ever woke up with in the morning. The years after graduation hardened me into someone quite different from the strutting graduate who left campus that day headed for New York City, ready to offer the world his talent. The world, I discovered, was not all that interested. I wandered around my early twenties, paying rent and reading classifieds and wondering why the lights were not turning green for me. My dream was to be a famous musician, I played the piano, but after several years of dark, empty nightclubs, broken promises, bands that kept breaking up and producers who seemed excited about everyone but me, the dream soured. I was failing for the first time in my life. At the same time, I had my first serious encounter with death. My favorite uncle, my mother's brother, the man who had taught me music, taught me to drive, teased me about girls, thrown me a football that one adult whom I targeted as a child and said, that's who I want to be when I grow up, died of pancreatic cancer at the age of 44. He was a short, handsome man with a thick mustache, and I was with him for the last year of his life, living in an apartment just below his. I watched his strong body wither, then bloat, saw him suffer, night after night, doubled over at the dinner table, pressing on his stomach, his eyes shut, his mouth contorted in pain. Ah, God, he would moan. Ah, Jesus. The rest of us my aunt, his two young sons, me stood there, silently, cleaning the plates, averting our eyes. It was the most helpless I have ever felt in my life. One night in May, my uncle and I sat on the balcony of his apartment. It was breezy and warm. He looked out toward the horizon and said, through gritted teeth, that he wouldn't be around to see his kids into the next school year. He asked if I would look after them. I told him not to talk that way. He stared at me sadly. He died a few weeks later. After the funeral, my life changed. I felt as if time were suddenly precious, water going down an open drain, and I could not move quickly enough. No more playing music at half-empty nightclubs. No more writing songs in my apartment, songs that no one would hear. I returned to school. I earned a master's degree in journalism and took the first job offered, as a sports writer. Instead of chasing my own fame, I wrote about famous athletes chasing theirs. I worked for newspapers and freelanced for magazines. I worked at a pace that knew no hours, no limits. I would wake up in the morning, brush my teeth, and sit down at the typewriter in the same clothes I had slept in. My uncle had worked for a corporation and hated it same thing, every day and I was determined never to end up like him. I bounced around from New York to Florida and eventually took a job in Detroit as a columnist for the Detroit Free Press. The sports appetite in that city was insatiable they had professional teams in football, basketball, baseball, and hockey and it matched my ambition. In a few years, I was not only penning columns, I was writing sports books, doing radio shows, and appearing regularly on TV, 
spouting my opinions on rich football players and hypocritical college sports programs. I was part of the media thunderstorm that now soaks our country. I was in demand. I stopped renting. I started buying. I bought a house on a hill. I bought cars. I invested in stocks and built a portfolio. I was cranked to a fifth gear, and everything I did, I did on a deadline. I exercised like a demon. I drove my car at breakneck speed. I made more money than I had ever figured to see. I met a dark-haired woman named Janine who somehow loved me despite my schedule and the constant absences. We married after a seven-year courtship. I was back to work a week after the wedding. I told her and myself that we would one day start a family, something she wanted very much. But that day never came. Instead, I buried myself in accomplishments, because with accomplishments, I believed I could control things, I could squeeze in every last piece of happiness before I got sick and died, like my uncle before me, which I figured was my natural fate. As for Mori? Well, I thought about him now and then, the things he had taught me about being human and relating to others, but it was always in the distance, as if from another life. Over the years, I threw away any mail that came from Brandeis University, figuring they were only asking for money. So I did not know of Maury's illness. The people who might have told me were long forgotten, their phone numbers buried in some packed away box in the attic. It might have stayed that way, had I not been flicking through the TV channels late one night, when something caught my ear. The audiovisual. In March of 1995, a limousine carrying Ted Koppel, the host of ABC TV's Nightline, pulled up to the snow covered curb outside Maury's house in West Newton, Massachusetts. Maury was in a wheelchair full time now, getting used to helpers lifting him like a heavy sack from the chair to the bed and the bed to the chair. He had begun to cough while eating, and chewing was a chore. His legs were dead, he would never walk again. Yet he refused to be depressed. Instead, Maury had become a lightning rod of ideas. He jotted down his thoughts on yellow pads, envelopes, folders, scrap paper. He wrote bite-sized philosophies about living with death's shadow, accept what you are able to do and what you are not able to do, accept the past as past, without denying it or discarding it, learn to forgive yourself and to forgive others, don't assume that it's too late to get involved. After a while, he had more than 50 of these aphorisms, which he shared with his friends. One friend, a fellow Brandeis professor named Maury Stein, was so taken with the words that he sent them to a Boston Globe reporter, who came out and wrote a long feature story on Maury. The headline read, A Professor's Final Course, His Own Death. The article caught the eye of a producer from the Nightline show, who brought it to Koppel in Washington, D.C. Take a look at this, the producer said. Next thing you knew, there were cameramen in Maury's living room and Koppel's limousine was in front of the house. Several of Maury's friends and family members had gathered to meet Koppel, and when the famous man entered the house, they buzzed with excitement all except Maury, who wheeled himself forward, raised his eyebrows, and interrupted the clamor with his high, sing-song voice. Ted, I need to check you out before I agree to do this interview. There was an awkward moment of silence, then the two men were ushered into the study. The door was shut. Man, one friend whispered outside the door, I hope Ted goes easy on Maury. I hope Maury goes easy on Ted, said the other. Inside the office, Maury motioned for Koppel to sit down. He crossed his hands in his lap and smiled. Tell me something close to your heart, Maury began. My heart? Koppel studied the old man. All right, he said cautiously, and he spoke about his children. They were close to his heart, weren't they? Good, Maury said. Now tell me something, about your faith. Koppel was uncomfortable. I usually don't talk about such things with people I've only known a few minutes. Ted, I'm dying, Maury said, peering over his glasses. 
I don't have a lot of time here. Koppel laughed. All right. Faith. He quoted a passage from Marcus Aurelius, something he felt strongly about. Mori nodded. Now let me ask you something, Koppel said. Have you ever seen my program? Mori shrugged. Twice, I think. Twice? That's all? Don't feel bad. I've only seen Oprah once. Well, the two times you saw my show, what did you think? Mori paused. To be honest? Yes? I thought you were a narcissist. Koppel burst into laughter. I'm too ugly to be a narcissist, he said. Soon the cameras were rolling in front of the living room fireplace, with Koppel in his crisp blue suit and Mori in his shaggy gray sweater. He had refused fancy clothes or makeup for this interview. His philosophy was that death should not be embarrassing, he was not about to powder its nose. Because Mori sat in the wheelchair, the camera never caught his withered legs. And because he was still able to move his hands Mori always spoke with both hands waving he showed great passion when explaining how you face the end of life. Ted, he said, when all this started, I asked myself, am I going to withdraw from the world, like most people do, or am I going to live? I decided I'm going to live or at least try to live the way I want, with dignity, with courage, with humor, with composure. There are some mornings when I cry and cry and mourn for myself. Some mornings, I'm so angry and bitter. But it doesn't last too long. Then I get up and say, I want to live. So far, I've been able to do it. Will I be able to continue? I don't know. But I'm betting on myself that I will. Koppel seemed extremely taken with Mori. He asked about the humility that death induced. Well, Fred, Mori said accidentally, then he quickly corrected himself. I mean Ted. Now that's inducing humility, Koppel said, laughing. The two men spoke about the afterlife. They spoke about Mori's increasing dependency on other people. He already needed help eating and sitting and moving from place to place. What, Koppel asked, did Mori dread the most about his slow, insidious decay? Mori paused. He asked if he could say this certain thing on television. Koppel said go ahead. Mori looked straight into the eyes of the most famous interviewer in America. Well, Ted, one day soon, someone's gonna have to wipe my ass. The program aired on a Friday night. It began with Ted Koppel from behind the desk in Washington, his voice booming with authority. Who is Maury Schwartz, he said, and why, by the end of the night, are so many of you going to care about him? A thousand miles away, in my house on the hill, I was casually flipping channels. I heard these words from the TV set, who is Maury Schwartz? And went numb. It is our first class together, in the spring of 1976. I enter Maury's large office and notice the seemingly countless books that line the wall, shelf after shelf. Books on sociology, philosophy, religion, psychology. There is a large rug on the hardwood floor and a window that looks out on the campus walk. Only a dozen or so students are there, fumbling with notebooks and syllabi. Most of them wear jeans and earth shoes and plaid flannel shirts. I tell myself it will not be easy to cut a class this small. Maybe I shouldn't take it. Mitchell? Maury says, reading from the attendance list. I raise a hand. Do you prefer Mitch? Or is Mitchell better? I have never been asked this by a teacher. I do a double take at this guy in his yellow turtleneck and green corduroy pants, the silver hair that falls on his forehead. He is smiling. Mitch, I say. Mitch is what my friends called me. Well, Mitch it is then, Maury says, as if closing a deal. And, Mitch? Yes? I hope that one day you will think of me as your friend. The orientation. As I turned the rental car onto Maury Street in West Newton, a quiet suburb of Boston, 
I had a cup of coffee in one hand and a cellular phone between my ear and shoulder. I was talking to a TV producer about a piece we were doing. My eyes jumped from the digital clock my return flight was in a few hours to the mailbox numbers on the tree-leaned suburban street. The car radio was on, the all-news station. This was how I operated, five things at once. Roll back the tape, I said to the producer. Let me hear that part again. Okay, he said. It's gonna take a second. Suddenly, I was upon the house. I pushed the brakes, spilling coffee in my lap. As the car stopped, I caught a glimpse of a large Japanese maple tree and three figures sitting near it in the driveway, a young man and a middle-aged woman flanking a small old man in a wheelchair. Mori. At the sight of my old professor, I froze. Hello, the producer said in my ear. Did I lose you? I had not seen him in sixteen years. His hair was thinner, nearly white, and his face was gaunt. I suddenly felt unprepared for this reunion for one thing, I was stuck on the phone and I hoped that he hadn't noticed my arrival, so that I could drive around the block a few more times, finish my business, get mentally ready. But Mori, this new, withered version of a man I had once known so well, was smiling at the car, hands folded in his lap, waiting for me to emerge. Hey, the producer said again. Are you there? For all the time we'd spent together, for all the kindness and patience Mori had shown me when I was young, I should have dropped the phone and jumped from the car, run and held him and kissed him hello. Instead, I killed the engine and sunk down off the seat, as if I were looking for something. Yeah, yeah, I'm here, I whispered, and continued my conversation with the TV producer until we were finished. I did what I had become best at doing, I tended to my work, even while my dying professor waited on his front lawn. I am not proud of this, but that is what I did. Now, five minutes later, Mori was hugging me, his thinning hair rubbing against my cheek. I had told him I was searching for my keys, that's what had taken me so long in the car, and I squeezed him tighter, as if I could crush my little lie. Although the spring sunshine was warm, he wore a windbreaker and his legs were covered by a blanket. He smelled faintly sour, the way people on medication sometimes do. With his face pressed close to mine, I could hear his labored breathing in my ear. My old friend, he whispered, you've come back at last. He rocked against me, not letting go, his hands reaching up for my elbows as I bent over him. I was surprised at such affection after all these years, but then, in the stone walls I had built between my present and my past, I had forgotten how close we once were. I remembered graduation day, the briefcase, his tears at my departure, and I swallowed because I knew, deep down, that I was no longer the good, gift-bearing student he remembered. I only hoped that, for the next few hours, I could fool him. Inside the house, we sat at a walnut dining room table, near a window that looked out on the neighbor's house. Maury fussed with his wheelchair, trying to get comfortable. As was his custom, he wanted to feed me, and I said all right. One of the helpers, a stout Italian woman named Connie, cut up bread and tomatoes and brought containers of chicken salad, hummus, and tabbouli. She also brought some pills. Mori looked at them and sighed. His eyes were more sunken than I remembered them, and his cheekbones more pronounced. This gave him a harsher, older look until he smiled, of course, and the sagging cheeks gathered up like curtains. Mitch, he said softly, you know that I'm dying. I knew. All right, then. Maury swallowed the pills, put down the paper cup, inhaled deeply, then let it out. Shall I tell you what it's like? What it's like? To die? Yes, he said. Although I was unaware of it, our last class had just begun. It is my freshman year. Mori is older than most of the teachers, and I am younger than most of the students, having left high school a year early. To compensate for my youth on campus, I wear old gray sweatshirts and box in a local gym and walk around with an unlit cigarette in my mouth, even though I do not smoke. 
I drive a beat-up Mercury Cougar, with the windows down and the music up. I seek my identity in toughness but it is Maury's softness that draws me, and because he does not look at me as a kid trying to be something more than I am, I relax. I finish that first course with him and enroll for another. He is an easy marker, he does not much care for grades. One year, they say, during the Vietnam War, Maury gave all his male students A's to help them keep their student deferments. I begin to call Maury, coach, the way I used to address my high school track coach. Maury likes the nickname. Coach, he says. All right, I'll be your coach. And you can be my player. You can play all the lovely parts of life that I'm too old for now. Sometimes we eat together in the cafeteria. Maury, to my delight, is even more of a slob than I am. He talks instead of chewing, laughs with his mouth open, delivers a passionate thought through a mouthful of egg salad, the little yellow pieces spewing from his teeth. It cracks me up. The whole time I know him, I have two overwhelming desires, to hug him and to give him a napkin. 